Well, I picked a bunch of caddis patterns to demo because the caddis pattern is, you know, when you look at the types of bugs, the main ones, everybody, you got the stoneflies, you got the mayflies, you got the caddis, and then you've got the, the, uh, the other flies, the gnats and stuff. But when you look at most waters, you've got uh, pollution to come in on and, and or if you've got water quality pro issues, the first one to go is the mayfly. The second one to go is the stonefly, but the caddis are more or less the garbage guys of the river. If, if any river has bugs in it, they've got caddis in it. Now, unfortunately, the, many of the caddis don't come out like the mayflies have specific hatches that are identify over long periods of time. There's a few, the October caddis, but, uh, and the Mother's Day caddis, but for the most part, the caddis come out virtually, you know, various times all year long. And some of the uh, problems that fly fishers have is many of them emerge or come out at night. So the, you don't see them sometimes so much during the day. They also, rather than emerging and coming up to the surface and sitting for any length of time, they either crawl out towards the edge and emerge or pretty much like what a stonefly does, or they will emerge very quickly from there and as they come up and when they hit the surface of the water, they, they are right into flight. So they're not sitting there drying their wings. They emerge pretty much ready to fly off. And sometimes you'll hear splats and stuff and you think, oh yeah, they're hitting something. And you look out there and you're trying to figure out what's going on. But quite often it's the female caddis coming back to lay their eggs. And they will fly fairly uh, over the surface and all of a sudden they'll just die right into the water. And the splat that they make and the ring that you see may be from them going down below the surface rather than from a fish coming up to get them. So it can be a kind of a confusing bug to, to work with. There's a couple things you want to try to remember. The shape of the caddis. This is the wing shape for a caddis fly. And if this was an actual caddis attached to the head up here, the body is probably only going to be from here to here. We see a long wing on this bug, but quite often only half of it is really where the juicy part of the bug is. And so you want to kind of try to keep that in mind if you're trying to imitate a pattern. The other thing you have to remember is a caddis has a fat butt. They're bigger at the back and smaller towards the front. It's just kind of the reverse of the type of tapering that we do when we're looking at a mayfly. So anywhere from a fat back up sloping up to a front a little bit is good or you can just do a level body. Now, the first pattern that I'm going to do is, is called the skittering caddis. Now I may have, I may have uh, called it a skating caddis, but in larger sizes, Sometimes you'll use a skating pattern to track steelhead. Well, this is kind of like that, only smaller. And essentially, it's, it's a real quick, fairly quick tie. It's also one that uses very few materials. You have a body that's dubbed on there. And then you have deer hair or the wing going over there, and you've got deer hair, spun deer hair, and then trimmed off for the, for the head and the collar area. And then uh, there's no hackle and there's no tail. And it's 
flat on the bottom, so it sits right down into the water. So the uh, materials, you basically got deer hair, You've got a hook, and the hook I use is the, it's a Daiichi 1710. And then what I've got is some, just some Adams dry fly super fine for the dubbing for the body. And if you want a lighter colored uh, body, you can use, you know, deer hair comes in various, depending on the time of the kill and the, and the variety. This is a piece of deer hair that used to belong to Darwin Adkins and then went to Al, Gret, Al Beatty, and then he gave me a swatch of it. And I think it's, uh, it looks an awful lot like elk, but I don't know if it's elk or whitetail for sure. Jim, it's, uh, it's off of an elk hide. Elk hide, okay. And you, so you can use either elk or deer for this pattern. Now, if you're one of those people that come from Ireland, they always like to have an egg sack on their caddis patterns. And so you can take some little Mackenzie green uh, caddis and make a ball of that at the back, you know, for for and dub it on for a for a uh, uh, egg sack if you want. Um, just about all of theirs, they they really like that. Now, let's see, get the hook out. I always like to uh, bend the barb down on a hook. And sometimes I usually do it the way you're not supposed to. Now this is in size 10. You're supposed to do all of your things like bend the barb down prior to tying the fly so that if you bend it down when you're out there on the river and you, after you got it tied on and they bend the barb down and it snaps on you, you got a problem. Jim, uh, Larry wants to know what size hook. Okay, this is a Daiichi size 12, 17, 10. Okay, 12, size 12. So um, 10s or 12s are good for this pattern. 12s, uh, I had a box of 12 someplace, but now I know, good question about where I put it because for demo purposes, but the 12 will work. And the thread, all I'm gonna do is use some uh, gray thread. And usually mount the thread about an eye length back. And you can hold on to, a, to, the, to the waist at an angle while you wrap back. And that kind of helps keep all of the wraps together as you wrap down to the end. Now, my end of the is down right about above where the barb would be if I was going to make an egg layer out of it, I'd ball up with some of that little green and make an egg. Hatch. Now, you know, your body can be gray, tan brown, black, green, ginger, whatever you want to match the color of whatever 
natural caddis is in your area. Now, there's all sorts of ways of dubbing. One way is, is to form a dubbing noodle. What I usually like to do is to get a long little stretch like this, put it down here. And then what I'll do is I'll go around just enough to catch the end of those. And then when you start to spin this, I've got the dubbing loop back here held between my little finger and the palm on the hand there. And then I'm twisting and coming down and you can twist this up pretty fine. And then you can use your rotary real easy. Just work it back to the rear because you want a fat rear anyway there. Couple turns. Now notice that if I have it held like this, if I loosen this up a little bit, let go, it thickens up. And then you can wrap forward. And you know, you can wrap around too. But that pretty much gives you the profile you want where it's large in the back and small on the front and trim off the waist area. Now for this pattern, I just made a mistake that I want to let you know about. Instead of starting that right close up behind the hook, I should have started it back here a little bit further where my fingernail is. Because if you try to spin, what I'm trying to do is to clean off that area. If you try to spin deer hair on a shank that has already got some thread wraps on it, it doesn't spin quite as well. Now the first batch, I don't want to really spin. So I've got some little bit of there of, of uh, covered area. So I'm going to take a chunk of deer. What I do is I take it, I grab it like this, and then I've got my, my little comb, comb out the fuzz and the clean it up because you don't want all of that other stuff there. Now I do have a sack that normally I have it down here, but I'm not going to worry about making a mess. I'll clean it up later. And then I've got several different size stackers. I got this one big one. And for deer hair, I like to use the large one. And I can stack it. Don't make the mistake of doing this when you're tying a fly, pounding it on your stand, because every vibration, the thread stays in the same place. This moves up and down. And if you've got stuff on there, you can loosen it up. And then take it out. There are the tips. And if you've got some that are too long or some that are hanging down on the side here, what I need to do is put my <laughs> magnifying glasses on <laughs> there. So you get the bundle, it's a fairly large amount there. Um, but we want to make sure that the end of the fly 
is back behind the end of the body. So another thing I found is that if I use these two fingers, you could see in here, tight space, loose space. But if I put these fingers together, they're pretty well flat all the way across. And you can hold on to things a lot better. So I take where I want my tie-in spot. And I will hold this bundle with the middle or the long finger and the thumb pinched together and come down right on the top of the back here and make one, two wraps and break your thread. So, <laughs> that was one of the fastest thread break recoveries I've seen. <laughs> well, hopefully it'll work. Because what I want is most of that to stay up on top in the back. And then I want it to work through the spinning. Like that. Push this back. And then I've got this little device here with a, a hole in the end that I can come in here and push back on the front. Now the second bunch, you can end up putting two or three bunches on depending on what size hook you use. Again, you clean out the little pieces and the fuzz pieces. Now you don't really have to stack this one. And what I do is I reverse it because I'll be trimming this one off a lot. And this way it puts the stubs towards the back and, and the long pieces again, go around sort of easy twice and then start to spin. And work your thread through, push it back. Come in front. Whip finish. Now, Al, it's difficult to do the perfect whip finish, but I got the thread to the back. And usually, if you got a big enough place, I'll make, I made about five turns there, but I'll, which since it broke it, it was okay, but you can sometimes just do three turns and two whip finishes of three turns each. And it's a little stronger that way. Now it looks like you got a mess here. This is a double edged razor blade mounted in this little thing made by Stonefly. Well, which, I like that one. What's the yeah. name of the tool? Well, it says it's Stonefly is on the front of it there. And it bends the double-edged razor so you don't have to worry about it. 
And the first one that you do is, is at an angle, off the sides, And the one along the very bottom, you turn it upside nice if you have a rotary, but you turn it up, you go straight along the bottom. And then you come back and you start working this head at an angle till you get back to where you can see where the wing starts. And your double, you know, these old double sided razor blades tend to be a little thinner than the single blade edge, single edge razor blades. And that thinness allows it, they, they, they're sharper because they got a finer, you know, these razor blades, they're good. But in, and they're nice in that you can hold on to one end without cutting yourself. But the problem is, is that they're not as sharp and nothing dulls blades up like, like a razor, I mean like deer hair. Then you come in here and you start clipping the long fibers. This is where I end up hooking myself a lot because I want to have a tendency to want to <laughs> brush it back. And what I'm trying to do is to keep it flat pretty much along the very bottom. And double check to make sure that when you look at the very bottom of this fly, whether or not you've got part of the wing coming down and covering up the shape of that or the body a little bit. And if you do, trim them out. Now you've got a nice flat body. You've got the shape of the wing for a caddis, and you got the general, the, the caddis shaped body to it. And then I've got some of that stuff, like, you know, that, that healthy hoof. I bought it, and then I put it into these smaller jars. And when I put glue on, I've got what I've done is I've taken a, a dowel and I've got. Uh, an insect mounting pin. It's much smaller in diameter than a bodkin. You put these two together, you can see the difference between those two. This holds a whole bunch of glue. This holds a much finer amount. And you can get right in there. And this stuff flows like the Dickens into your materials. Now, if you really wanted to make it a skater, hard skater, you could put some glue in there. It would soak down in, which would help stiffen it up a little bit. But that's pretty stiff in there. Now, the last step on any of your ties should be taking a uh, stem of a feather and making sure that eye is open. So that's the first pattern, the skittering caddis. And 
you know, casting out and letting it float down and then sometimes below me, I'll, I'll skitter it back towards me and just make it work back on, on the surface of the water. Does that make a wake? Yeah, it'll, it'll make a wake. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, I do. This is Doug. What is, what is the name of the uh, head cement you're using with the insect mounting pin? Okay, that cement is stuff that uh, Al was talking about. It's called Healthy Hoof. And it's a hoof lacquer that uh, I guess vets and horse trainers use to over the hooves of horses. And uh, you can get it from Amazon. And it's in a much bigger bottle than this. I got the bottle here. This is the bottle you get it in. And in small print, it says uh, ideal for personal nail care. Uh -huh. Now, when you go through and you look at the ingredients, that you may want to pay attention to because there's some things in here that. Uh, you know, it is flammable, but there are some ingredients in here. And what I did is I went through my chemical dictionary because I'm a chemistry teacher. So I went through the chemical dictionary and looked them all up. And lacquer is, was made originally from the uh, fluorescent shells off of uh, certain bugs, beetles. But there is another... Uh, lacquer that you can make commercially that bypasses that and uses something else. Formaldehyde is one of the use things that's in here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's something that uh, you probably want to make sure that you don't breathe a lot. <laughs> when you use it? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to look through here where the, uh, someplace it, it talks, well, I, I looked up on in a chemical dictionary lacquer. And when you get the ingredients there and go through the whole thing, it's, I don't think you could sell it in California. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's very good and it does a good job. Sally Hansen's is, was my, up until I started using this for, most of my ties, I was using Sally Hansen's. The other one that you can use uh, when I tie salmon flies is very thin and penetrates. And when you touch it onto something, it really flows in is uh, something called Celere, C-E-L-I-R-E. -E. It's a French name. Uh, and it, it basically is, is uh, has some heptane in it, which is <laughs> That's the stuff that you use to thin uh, shoe goo and also um, um, uh, uh, rubber cement. And if you leave the lid off the bottle, within a couple hours, a bottle the size of Sally Hansen's fingernail polish will probably be half evaporated. And it's extremely flammable, so you want to be careful with that. But, but it's it flows in and, and really penetrates down into the materials. And that's what you usually want. Um, not question just- here, Question here, Jim. Uh, do you get that Celere on Amazon? It's been harder and harder to get because it cannot be air shipped. It has to go ground. So it, when they get it from the manufacturer, it usually comes in by boat from France and then it has to be shipped by land. Now, there is a supplier in Canada that I ran into when I was up in New Brunswick at the Atlantic salmon uh, fishing thing. And, and he said, oh, just send me a letter. I'll get it to you. And he'll mail it without, he'll just mail it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's about eight bucks a bottle. Wow. And it's really not that easy to find. Rich Youngers used to handle it, but I don't 
don't know if he uh, uh, he's doesn't has it have a shop anymore, and I'm not sure just who his supplier was. Um, Castleman, I think, back east might have been one of the uh, suppliers. Uh, Jim, yeah, uh, what is your um, the, your thread size? It was it six odd or eight odd or? On this um, one, I used eight odd. Eight odd, okay. Usually when you're spinning hair, you're smart to maybe use six aught. Or you can even use Nymo, which is a nylon thread. Um, one thing you want to make sure is wherever you store your materials, don't let sunlight fall on your spools of thread, especially the UTC threads. Uh, they fade, some of the colors will fade, but it also will, the ultraviolet rays will also affect the, the strength of the fiber, at least it has for me. Every once in a while I'll run into one that, in a store that, uh, you know, they've got their threads up nice and colorful next in the window and whatever, and you find out <laughs> they're breaking on me all the time. Hmm. But you can see how that fly will hug the surface. Yeah, look at that. And this was the one in size 10. And that one I used a green body on. No, I didn't. I used, it's gray. I haven't done it yet, but I want to use the Mackenzie River green color on, on some of these and try them out down on the Mackenzie River to see if it if it successfully catches some fish. Now the next pattern that I was any other questions on this pattern? Okay, the next one I was going to tie is one that Oh, when I was about 10 or 12, when I started tying flies, went down to Myron. I lived in Portland. I go down to Myron Franks and on the sixth floor, Audrey Joy used to tie there. And I found out later that uh, there were several other of her boys, as she would call them, that would go down. We never saw each other because we'd be there at different times, but she had a sewing machine and she tied and she basically gave us patterns if we watched or if we talked about them from all over the country. Well, one that she was very well known for tying and very quickly being able to tie it was the tied down caddis. And I it's been called, I think, a horn or something or other, but there is another name for it. But it's not the Tom Thumb. But it looks like this. And it's a deer hair shell back. And early in the season, you go with the yellow body. And it's got deer hair over the top and you've got a brown hackle or you can use a furnace and that's the early it, it represents a uh, a crest bug which is or a caddis that's working in the LOD of the, the you know you, you, the uh, plant life on the Deschutes you get a lot of that also on the metolius um, Usually you start out in the early season with a size 10 hook yellow body. And as the season gets to the middle, you switch to a size 12 with a slightly orangish colored body. And then by the time you get to September and the late season, you switch to a size 14 or a, you can even go smaller than that, but you get a much darker orange because as the season progresses, the flies will get 
smaller and go from the lighter yellow color to a darker orange color. So uh, I've, this is always the, the tie down caddis has been my go to pattern. And um, hook wise, usually there are some, uh, you know, I've got several different hooks possible here. The Mustad 3906 in a size 10, 14, and 12. And then there's also a partridge wide gape one. What you basically want is a fairly wide gape and a heavy shank on the, on the hook. And there are some Daiichi patterns that uh, I think do that. I always tied this since I've been 14 years old and I'm 78 now. But I was always tended to use the mustad hook. Part of it was is that's the one that Audrey Joy used. And it's a sprout bend but it's a fairly heavy. Can you explain that bend? Okay, a perfect bend comes down the shank and makes a nice round circle. And then you've got a sprout which comes down and starts to drop off and then makes the circle round. A limerick will come down and then really make a angle drop and then straight back. So for a lot of your, your uh, ties for uh, lake fish and for streamers, we'll often use that limerick bend. It, it uh, has a, a, a lot of the Wrangley streamers from back east and then the New York area and Maine, and they use the limerick bend but the limerick bend is, is almost like, I don't know if you can catch that or not, but it comes down and like that. But the sprout is somewhere in between. So you got a drop off here, but it's not, you can see that instead of being nice and rounded right here where the, it starts to go forward again, it's kind of as comes down around and then all of a sudden straight forward. Thanks. That's good ex explanation. Good. Thanks. And on this one, the trick to this flight is to remember that you're going to be putting on, try to get, get some. <laughs> okay. Got to get my thread back in here. And this is a lesson as to why you always tell your students if they're borrowing these bobbins, do you always bring a, th a threader? put it in your mouth and suck on it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I always wondered about that. <laughs> well, yeah, you just got to think about who all has put their mouths on these things. Yeah, right. There, see? <laughs> now this one, Instead of just starting up here, you want to pull out a lot of thread, maybe a foot, and attach the thread at the front, maybe an eye length behind, and then wrap down.
till you're about above where the hook barb point is. And then put the line in the keeper. And then um, what I, when I use yellow, yellow is a hard color to dye wool. And so quite often the yellow that you get is not, um, it's not wool, it, it's a synthetic. Occasionally you can get a yellow wool, but it usually comes out more of a dirty yellow color. But the, uh, and, and what I have done in the, I've spooled, carted up a bunch. And that makes pretty thick body. So what usually happens is you find out that these wools or threads are made up of three or four. Like I go for the one that has four and then I peel it back. to just take two strands. Now, some people will tie this pattern very fat and thick. I don't. But I'll attach it back here. Wrap forward just a little bit. And then attach the hackle. Sometimes the more material you put on, you end up decreasing the, the hook gape. And then it's not as easy to catch the fish, but Okay, now I'm doing it so the shiny side is up. Tie that in, wrap the thread forward, trim off that stub. Now, when I wrap the body, I'm going to, now, you know, when you're dubbing, you you have a couple ways. You can either dub going this way, you can dub going that way. But remember, when you wrap your thread, every time you make a turn, this thread has made a half rotation. And to undo that, you end up spinning it this direction. Well, if I put my dubbing or things and wrap it that way and hold on to it while I wrap, I basically loosen it up. So if you always remember to tighten it up, go in the other direction. Then every time you make a turn, you are tightening up that wrap rather than making it loose. Now I'm going to make one good solid turn behind that hackle. And then I'm going to come forward Usually three to four turns, three turns should be able to hold your materials if you've got decent tension on it. Now take your hackle and spiral it up. Maybe make an extra turn or two at the front. Just make sure you leave space up here for, because we still got that head to put on there. Now, Audrey Joy, when she tied these, she tied them for quite a few guys that used to fish the, the Metolius back quite a few years ago. And they still do it. And this is my go-to fly. Uh, and I don't know if it's because that was one of the first patterns I learned. 
Maybe because it just works good, right? <laughs> and it does work good. Now, I come down on the top just to separate these and then push down a little bit so that it leaves a spot for that deer hair to go across. Now, the deer hair, you end up with Okay, here's one deer hair, dark. And I've got some that's dyed gray. And so I had that real nice piece of, of deer hair for that other pattern. But the problem is, see how long that is? And I only want to go from here to there with a little bit sticking out for that stub in the back. And that's wasting a lot of, of uh, all of that stuff. So plus it's a, it's a fiber that's a little bit heavier. Now this deer hair here is fairly fine in the shaft length there. And whenever you're cutting deer hair, make sure you use serrated scissors. Cuts it a lot easier. So I'm just cut off a, a little bunch of it. Clean it off. And you see how they, they do a lot of this stuff. You can also, during days when there's a lot of uh, less humidity and static electricity in the air, you have some fun uh, with deer That's hair. Fair. <laughs> now, what I've done is we're going to do is put it into a little smaller stacker. Take it out. You don't need a real big bunch. It's more or less you learn through experience, but I want, I don't want it sticking way out the back, but I want it, I want some stubs to come out the back. So you roughly get where you want to put the head there. And you'll see some of the guys, they demonstrate by pinching it and rotating it and pinching and rotating. That does help to pick up some of the strays that stick out. Now, what I usually do when I tie in a deer, you can make sure you hold with these fingers because they come together flat. What I will do is pre-glue Re-glue the hair, and I also put a little drop right where I'm going to mount that hair. Then I clean the head off. <laughs> put the bottle on before you breathe too much and get too high. And then make sure you have your scissors that are serrated. And I pre-cut. Why does that serrated scissor work so much better? It grabs the fibers and cuts them off without pushing them away. If you have your regular scissors without the serrations, 
deer hair is and any other elk hair and moose hair well, they, they sure tend to be pushed out of the way you didn't even have the decency to come to me i don't yeah. think she's talking to you let me move <laughs> there you go <laughs> keep going <laughs> okay and it pushes it out of the way and uh -huh. uh, you either have to cut it a couple of times or you have to uh uh recut and recut okay so that's that's it now i uh, just hold it right above where i'm going to tie it in come down come up with a soft loop around the back tighten coming down another soft loop and then tighten those up Now, sometimes when you, uh, if I don't pre cut, I'd have a bunch of stubs sticking out here. And then when I went in with the scissors and cut, there'd be quite a blunt. There'd be a nice come out and then boom. When you pre glue and pre cut, you can make this angle a lot better. Now, Jerry Chris, I think it was on the last showed how he has taken some of his deer hair and he'll cut it at an angle. And on things like a Normwood special or some of the others where you have more room, you can then do it, cut it that way. And but here I don't have a whole lot of room to cut that at an angle. So that's why I just went ahead and cut it off flat. But but now. You can see that it it doesn't have doesn't quite have a big drop off. Drop off. The opportunity to sign up for this, and and we talked it over, and and we believe that this is an opportunity to hmm. to keep our child safe. Well, I didn't safe. Laugh. And then, sorry, I've got one, two, three. Okay, I made four turns there, and if it doesn't break, which it did, if it didn't break, I'd make four more turns. Now, I'll clean that up later. Now, I pull this up a little bit to get it up and out of the way. I take this thread that I had back here, and I want to lay a little bit of a thread base right at the butt of this yellow body. Then I'm going to take that deer hair down, come up and over. And then do a whip finish. Whoa, that, now that's cool. <laughs> I can see Kathy's enjoying that one. <laughs> yeah, she goes, she gets a thumbs up. <laughs> now, on that one, I didn't pull so hard on the first through, so I was able to get two whip finishes on the back. Now you check it to make sure that when you went through the back, okay, the fibers should go straight back. You don't want them to cross over a bunch. You want just the tips here to flare out. Now I've seen some when you get too long of a shell back or too long of, of a, a material back there that it's got a long stubs. They still fish good, so don't worry about it. Um, The other thing is, is that quite often when you wrap around, you know, the thread torque will carry this edge over. And so you want to make sure that you're at least up halfway. Now on this one, I can see that it's, I'd probably just leave this fly, but just to show you, if this shell back has come over too far, you can take Pull some of those fibers out, and then with a pair of tweezers, you clean it up a little bit.
And what you find is that that allows some of these fibers of the hackle to come out to the sides more. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll pull those off to the edge, to the side a little bit. I have at times cut in the middle, but you really don't have to because you're not trying to get this to sit on the water. For the most part, this is, you want it to sink below this, the film. Now, if there is a fiber that causes you trouble, you got two options. You can leave it, take tweezers and pick it out or take a chance and burn it off. But that's for the other fishermen and the other people buying your flies, not for the fish. <laughs> Excellent. Any questions? And then I put head cement on both sections. I put some on the head. Hey, Jim, this is Jerry. How do you, how do you fish that in the river and how do you fish it in the lake? Okay, in the river, I have a floating line and usually I'll be in, in pocket water. And I just cast it over in and around behind the rocks, in front of the rocks, following the current. And sometimes if you are, uh, if you're like on the Deschutes, there's been a couple spots there. I'm offshore a little bit, waded out five or 10 feet if I'm lucky, or just along the shore, cast out let it uh, drift down. Sometimes if I'm out in the water, I let it drift down below me. And then uh, as you just let it go and it's, it'll sink a little bit cause it's, you know, it gets wet and stuff, but it's down below the water surface. And then as it reaches the end of the, you know, it, it goes down and then rises up. And it's during that rise up, let's see here, get over here to this thing. And... Oh, there you are. <laughs> you know, it's, it's flowing down away from you and then it rises up. And at that point, you should strip out six, 10 feet of line. And what that does is it makes it go back down. And then when it reaches that bottom again, it rises back up and it acts as it is a emerging caddis larva, you know, or, or pupa. It's gone into the adult stage. That's called the lyser ring lift, I think. And it's a very effective way of fishing at the end of a, of a cast. Because quite often, fish will be following it. And when it starts to rise, that's when they hit it. Or if they don't hit it the first time, if it drops back down and does it the second time, it sometimes increases the, the uh, catch rate a little bit. On a lake, what I like to do is take a floating line with a uh, sink tip, uh, a nine or 10 foot sink tip on it cast it out. Usually I'm in a, in a pontoon boat or pontoon belly boat or whatever. And, or if you're just in a boat, cast it out. And then I back off from it, strip line out and back off from it, wait a while so that it allows it to sink. And then two ways you can do it. You can either just strip it in a little bit or the other thing you can do is you can change directions, go this way and then turn, you know, and, and guys that fish with spoons and stuff have learned this that quite often it's when that hits that turn on the one out there when the fly all of a sudden changes direction, that's when <laughs> something that's following, it tends to want to hit it. Right. And quite often there may be two or three fish out there and all of a sudden competition, you know, they see, oh, it's moving and one makes a move for it and, and boom. So just kind of a trick for trolling back and forth a little bit, but slow. Now, 
there's been several streams that have dumped in. There was one up there, I was fishing below Grand Coulee Dam, and there's a little stream that comes in there and a uh, fairly decent flow to it. And there's some weed beds there and I was casting upstream and letting it drift down and using that laser ring lift type of thing and um, having it come in near shore. So, and then on East Lake, I've used that with the uh, with the uh, sink tip over by the hot spring area where there's that uh, plant growth underneath. And I'm offshore, cast over to it, let the fly sink down so it's close to the weed beds, but you're just off from the weed beds because there's some browns that like to hang out just outside of that area looking for smaller fish that are coming and feeding on the on the bugs that are in that plant growth oh that's a great tip jim i know <laughs> i hate wow. to i hate to tell people that <laughs> oh boy that's yeah. a good one thank you so much do you use a do you this jerry again do you use a a, a long a longer leader with that with that sink tip or, or do you go with nine ten feet or something well, yeah, usually I have a, a leader about as long as a rod, you know, so I fish okay. with a nine foot rod. Right. Usually that's enough. Uh, there are times when I wish I had a 12 footer on. You, know, you look <laughs> down in that water and you can see a big fish down there. But, but uh, in, when I'm fishing rivers and streams, I don't go, you know, the, the nine foot, eight foot leader usually is long enough. Okay. At least for me, it has been. Great, I thank you. Experimented enough. <laughs> well, yeah, great. thank you. That was, these that was are, good. These have been really good. Thank you so much. Yeah, now this is the. I'll get back to the other camera here. Yeah, we have time for another one. Hope so. I yeah. got got yeah. six of them ready. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> what we got? Uh, uh, let's see. Everybody's still here too. Well, uh, just only a few had to go. Uh, Jerry Yang. And uh, Jerry Ng had to leave for another meeting, but we we still have 24 people here interested in what's happening next. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this next one is what's called a slow water caddis. Now that first one that I showed you, that skittering caddis, that one was demonstrated by a guy. Uh, tying it from I from Iceland. And this one there's the bag of materials essentially. <laughs> you got a hook. You've got some wings, you've got CDC, and you've got a hackle. And this will essentially, it's, it's good for lakes, slow water, not really a bunch of ripply stuff. I got it out of a book. There's a book, I think Lyser and somebody else wrote it, Caddis Patterns. And what I'm using on this, again, it's it's a Daiichi hook. Basically, it's a it's just a standard dry fly hook is all. And again, you can use. You can use the, I'm starting the thread about an eye length back, laying a thread base. 
And I think in the directions are the colors that I have for this one. Uh, all of for the six or eight dot for the for the thread. And this is kind of like an olive brown or tan. And the rib is just thread. So what I'm going to do for the rib is just to come down and make a dubbing loop type of thing. Put that back in the keepers out of the way. And that's going to be what I'll use for the rib. And then in terms of the uh, dubbing uh, ginger body, what I use is the super fine and I get the, uh, the it's, it's the super fine waterproof fly dubbing. And it's got some more of the caddis. It's got cinnamon caddis, it's got tan, gray olive, brown olive, various colors on that. I'm gonna use the, the tan color. Excuse me, Jim, who makes that super fine dubbing? I knew you were going to ask for it. I was looking at it. I didn't get it from Hairline. I think it's Hairline is where I, yeah. They have it anyway. Yeah, it's and, carried by most of the fly shops now. Yeah. Thank you. And they usually will make like this is super fine number two because I think super fine number one has more of the mayfly colors in it. Okay, I've made my little uh, attach it there, go across once or twice to catch it, and then you can spin this on. And then I'm going to dub or wrap it on. Now you could go ahead and just wrap, you know, or you can use the, I like to get a fat butt on this one. It keeps wanting to. <laughs> In caddis bodies, you don't have to worry too much about. in terms of being perfect shaped. I got to remember on this pattern to leave enough space up front for your for your uh, hackle and the the uh, underwing are these CDC plumes. Try to get the CDCs, you know, that have enough fibers length on the side, and stack two or three of them together. And that's four of them. Pull the fibers forward. Now this is an underwing, which is used to support the other wing plus give a little flotation. So I don't need to go clear back on this one. So I'm just going back to the end of the body pretty much. And again, I'm holding things together with the long finger and the thumb, go up with a soft loop down, around, up. And when you tighten up, you always tighten on the upstroke. That way things don't rotate on you.
trim off the waste. Just smoothing out the base a little bit there. Now I'm using these preformed wings. They come in a package. Um, you can you can get cut wings made from feathers. You can get these things that are called perfect cut wings, and all they are is a material that's kind of a uh, and and uh, they've already done the cutting. Or you can go ahead and you can buy the things and cut them yourself. There's there's uh, little razor blade things mounted on a piece of wood that you press down and it's like a cookie cutter type of situation. And uh, this is pretty wide at the base. And these, it says it's either caddis or stonefly wings. So I'm gonna come in and cut the edge down a little bit. And the wing, remember, is longer than the body. So I probably wanted to go clear back to there. Nobody told me. I forgot <laughs> about the rib. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll rib it. <laughs> you can recover a piece of cake. <laughs> Normally, you would, the ribbing is just makes the fly stronger, the body stronger. So we're not, it, it, I hope I'm not being graded on my ribbing. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's. I'll tell you what, when I you look get, back. You're doing a great job, Jim. I mean, I can see everything really clearly. Now, all I got to do is figure out where I dropped the wing. Okay, get another wing out. I trim this front part of this wing so that I don't have that much bulk at the front of the fly. Okay, now that goes down like that. And you want to take these two fingers and come on either side of it and fold it over. Soft loop. Make sure that it's centered on the top of it. Boy, that's really worth it to buy the wings instead of trying to cut them yourself. It's it quicker. It a lot of time, yeah. Yeah. And you can get them in different colors and modeled and so, you know, and, and, and they've done all of that. And they make good, they, they, you can buy a mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies. Now there's the one I had. Now I know what I did with it. <laughs> I won't put two wings on it. Okay. And then now I'm using a ginger, barred ginger um, grizzly. But again, you want colors depending on the pattern that you have. Come off the butt and then make Sometimes you. This is a great fly, Jim. And sometimes you want to 
pull back the fibers so that you can get enough wraps on. Hold it straight up, come up in between there, the stem in there and make three wraps tying that down. Then what I do is I pull this all the way back shorten up the thread so I don't hit the camera too much. Form the head. Whip finish. Trying to get it so that the threads advance forward as you pull, as you wrap down. So you, and I'm doing two of them. So I, the one in the far back, one in the middle, and one right behind the eye. Sometimes instead of cutting, if you just put your scissors in there, make it V and then push, it slices it off. And then you got this one to take care of. Oops, that'll happen, which is good. Just broke itself, it's fine enough stem. Now with this one, you got the CDC under the, under the, the overwing. You can still see the body. And you can, if you want to, you could go in there and you could, you know, get this thing to go out to the side and you could go in and trim it if you want to, or just leave it like it is. Um, but that's, that's the, uh, what's called the slow water caddis. Excellent pattern. Wow. And those little wonder wings, you know, here's one tied And it, it's a little black caddis. Wow. And I think that's is probably tied on a, I think it's an 18. Could be a 16, but I think it's an 18. I was fishing one winter over on the Metolius, you know, and It was nothing was coming up and the fish weren't really interested in anything and at least nothing that you could tell. And um, all of a sudden it was snowing and, and cold and all of a sudden it stopped. There was a sun break and this little black cat has just came out just all over the place. Fish were slapping crazy at them. And by the time I got my fly on, or something similar, it was over because the clouds came in, <laughs> sun went away, the caddis disappeared. <laughs> that river is the most frustrating river ever created. Teaches you humility though. So that one was the, uh, that caddis. Now, is there time for more or what? Well, it's 620 and usually an hour and a half is, uh, is good, but there's still 23 people here. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, we started out with uh, 25 and 23 are still here. Yeah. It's pretty good. Well, I was going to show, you know, um, Gretchen, is she still on? Yep. They're still here. Okay. She was talking about, cutting foam and this is a little deal that I got Schollmeyer gave it to me it's actually uh, he got it from the guys up in Canada the larva lace guys yeah and I don't know if they sell them or build it for them or what but it's just a piece of, of wood edges on it a little shelf there this black strip of Whatever it is, it's a kind of a real hard plastic. And then this plate glass. 
and the plate glass fits right in there. And you can take your foam and you don't need a, uh, you don't need the, you wouldn't really need, just, just all you really need is, is uh, a hard plastic service surface. And the plate glass with that stick, and then you have just a knife. One, yeah. one of these exacto knives like this. Oh yeah. And you can make whatever width you want. And it it it's uh you know, if you just have a, a piece of like one of those cutting surfaces and a nice, this plate glass is it's nice in that the sharp edges are gone. <laughs> That's a good product. Yeah. And, you know, you can just as long as you can go and get a piece of plate glass and you can just with emery board or with a... Uh, uh, sandpaper, not sandpaper, but the emery stuff you use, the black paper, just go like that over the edges and they'll round them off so you don't cut yourself and then use that and your knife. Makes it real nice. He uh, was we nice. We got time for this peacock caddis. Okay, that's good. One of, one of my favorites. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, peacock caddis. There, did you see that? <laughs> That was quick. <laughs> yeah, well, the peacock caddis uses a body of peacock quill. And the hook is uh, you just need a dry fly hook standard. And the one I usually, uh, I Size wise, it depends on what you want to do. I find that for demo purposes, I'll usually use a 10 simply so that it's big enough for people to see. And quite often, I know you're not supposed to do it this way, but it's got a micro barb. Usually I'll do that outside of the vise. And Al Beatty, sometimes you'll see him, he'll put it into the vise and clamp down on it. Okay, and, and this one I can use black thread. You can't see what I'm fumbling with over here on my table. <laughs> but I started an eye length back and that's simply a good procedure to follow because it keeps you from crowding the eye of the hook. And usually where that barb was or is, is a good spot to stop because that's most of your dry fly hooks come back and that's right above the barb and that's right where it starts to bend. And if you go now with the caddis, you're not worried about a tail. So you don't have to worry about uh, tail bending down too far over the bend. Uh, but threads, black, gray, olive, tan, body, peacock, curl, reinforced with a dubbing loop. So you take your I take 
four or five. On a size 10, that'd be four, I'm taking five. And then if you go to smaller hooks, if you keep the butts together, try not to drop them all. Come up to the tips, back a little ways from the, from the fine tips, trim them off. Come up, catch a thread with soft loop like that down over, pull up, trapping it. Come back, form a loop over. Now, sometimes if you're lucky, you can just go ahead and don't have to worry about crossing over. You should actually cross over to really latch those down, but. Uh, And then you go forward, but you only go forward to about half shank. Trim off these butts. And then I've got a little radio shack clip. Catch the loop, catch the materials. And again, I rotate looking down at this thing, I'm going counterclockwise so that with each wrap, instead of loosening up, it's tightening up. Because it, it up here, it, it, it's tight and nice. You got the hurl formed up back in here further. It's, that doesn't stick out, stick out as much. Another recovery here. You're very good at that. I'm learning about this part. Because it's not always easy to do that quick recovery. <laughs> and then you make your turns at the back. If you're going to be careful, you don't want to catch the hook because, boy, if you, it, sometimes it'll break one of those strands. And then you get down a little ways, and then I go ahead and I spin it again to make sure it tightens up good. Bring it up to about the halfway point. There's the body's form. And the body's reinforced because you've been using that, that dubbing loop. Okay, now, um, the wing is elk hair, uh, and it's over the back, extends past the rear of the body, and the butts over the eye eventually are trimmed. So you want to take your elk hair. I'll take some of that elk hair. Okay, this is the stuff that, that Al gave me from, from, from Darwin. Again, clean it out. And if you got your little brush here someplace, get rid of the fuzzy stuff. Get rid of the shorter fibers. And then locate your hair stack. Oh, there it is, hair stacker.
Now on this fly, I'm going to pre-glue, but I'm not going to pre-cut. And you want the hair to extend past over the back of the butt and back of the bend here. So I'm going to tie it in about in there. Now I've got a fairly large bundle. And when you do that, it's really difficult sometimes to get that thing to tighten up so that when you're through, you think you're through and then you pull down on your, your bobbin and the whole thing rotates on you. So sometimes you can trim this down or thin it out a little bit. Okay, now. It's rough when you do what I do. I just lay everything down and I'll search for it like mad <laughs> on the table. I got tired of spilling glue sometimes. So what I did was I took a little piece of wood, drilled a hole so that the glue could sit in, bottle could sit in it, and then drilled a couple of holes so that the needle can sit there. Yep, I gotta make same. one big, I gotta make one big enough for this bottle now. <laughs> yeah, that looks like a real handy tool. Well, it sure is. You know, every once in a while, you'll set your glue down and you'll go in with that needle and the, you're looking away in the process, you knock the bottle over and. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, figure out where you want it. Again, I'm going to be using these fingers. Middle finger and or the long, they call it the long finger. So you really have to develop a habit that that holds the material that way yeah because otherwise fred torque if you know if you use these fingers you've got a big open space there and they're being held tight at the top and real loose at the bottom and then that causes thread torque to bring those fibers that are down here underneath the hook and if you can especially if you're trying to tie something in on top of the hook these fingers hold it tight. Now what I'm doing is I'm working forward, keeping that bundle, trying to keep it up on top. And of course with thread pressure, they splay out on you, but that's okay. Get up near the top or the front of the eye. I'm going to pull back and post those pretty much like an elk hair caddis. And then I'm going to come back over the top of this and back and tighten those down, wraps, tighten them down. Now you can take your thumb on top and press down with the thumbnail and splay those so that from the bottom, you've got that caddis appearance of the wing going out and around the, the body. Now what I test to make sure is pull some tension on here to make sure that that thing isn't going to flip over. <laughs> it, it's exasperating when that happens. Okay, now the hackle on this is a grizzly and a 
what do they say? Brown, there's two hackles. Let's see. There's the directions. Okay. Should have hackle brown and grizzly. And you wrap those. And there's the brown. Okay, these are the hackles. And you want to clean off. the fuzzy parts. Now what I do when I wrap two hackles, I want this to be a dry fly. So I want fibers to stick forward in, you know, kind of come out in front and back. So what I'll do is I'll put them belly to belly. That way, when I wrap, one of them is going to cant their fibers forward, and the other one will cant their fibers back. That's interesting. And put this on there. And cut the stems. Now, some people wrap them one at a time. If you, what I do is I keep enough tension, but I allow my fingers to slip along the, as I'm pulling on them. And that keeps tension on both of them. And I can wrap them both at the same time. Now, occasionally one will start going back the other way and one forward, then you just got to stop and wrap them so that they're side by side. And if that doesn't work, then you just say a few words and wrap them one at a time. That makes them look real bushy and thick. Yeah, it does. And there's one, two, three, three, I'll do four turns. Usually, just to be safe, pull this back up, go underneath the head, and then do your whip finish. What I've done is I've been able to, there's a, the nut right, or this, yeah, the nut right here on my vise, I hang that, pull these back so I can wrap a fairly clean whip finish on this thing, pulling those back. Okay, I did five turns. Sometimes when you do too many turns and you start to pull, it'll get about there and all of a sudden it hangs up and you got a loop sticking out. That's the advantage of doing two sets of three. You still get six wraps around the head, but it helps. <laughs> okay, now pull that back, pull these forward. Locate where they are, the, the stems. Go in there with your scissors. And either slide and cut, or if you're careful with the real sharp tips, you can cut. And now, just like an elk hair caddis, You want to take serrated scissors because then it grips. Hold these up and you want to cut at the same angle as the wing. And if you got some fibers that you missed, you go in with your scissors and clean it up. 
if you check the bottom, if you've got some fibers that are sticking out, you can either go in with tweezers and pluck them or you can cut them. And then the last, second to the last step is, uh, let's see where I did I have that? There it is. See that one? It's clipped off at the flat at the bottom. So that's what you want to do. You want to trim off flat. Now, I sometimes have fun doing this. What I usually do is I take it out of the vise, turn it over, and face it towards me. I don't know if you can see very well or not, but okay. Because I can see the, the, uh, the hook shank and the hook point there. So I can put my scissors perpendicular to that and come across and trim all the way across. And then it catches these, but not those far ones. So then I turn it over and I do the same thing from this side. And now there's no hackles on the bottom. It's flat across the bottom. If you need to want to trim it up a little more, you can, but that just gives it a profile that sits on the water. You do want to make sure and check that the wings, the, these fibers here haven't come down around. If they have, you're going to have to clean them up because you want the body to be seen. You know, that's where you want it to sit. And ideally, these wings come out along the bottom parallel to that body about mid shank or, you know. Wow. And then, that's great, Jim. <laughs> and then you got to glue it. And <laughs> you got to glue it, yeah. And there's, because I, uh, what I'm going to do is take a fairly large drop and I'm going to put it right in between that front head and where I tied off the, the hackles here so that it soaks down in there where I tied off those hackle stems. And then I'll take and turn it over and I'll get right underneath here where the thread loop, where the thread is. And, you, oops. Pull these back. I probably got some in the eye of the hook, but again, the smart thing to do is to get that feather or well, it's down there someplace, but I'll just take this feather. And clean out the eye of the hook. All right. And then Great make sure you line. put the lid back on your glue. <laughs> yeah, right. Jim, this was just fantastic. Um, it Really, does anybody have any questions for Jim? Because uh, hopefully he'll uh, sign up for our series that's going to start in December. So we'll do another 20 classes. And Jerry Chris will be teaching the last class next Thursday. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> We, we got the brand new computer and everything else. <laughs> it's really good. So um, if you guys don't have any more questions, then uh, we're going to have a lot of fun next Thursday. And we'll be tripping along, giving, uh, giving it our best and save some extra time because Jerry's going to, he'll probably take the hour and a half to two hours. Yeah. He's smiling, right? We know that's going to happen. So, uh, hey, 
share real quick. Yes. I got I, I got your message. I was at the chiropractor this afternoon. So um, I will call you tomorrow, um, okay. probably after after lunch sometime. Um, what I'd like to do is 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 test maybe at five o'clock or or okay. something like that. With, so we have the right light. OK, OK, we can do that. We can do it Saturday, too. It makes no difference to me. But I got here. All the cameras work on the on the new computer. So. Well, we're all looking forward to it. And I, I got to say, the instructors in this series have been just e extremely. Yeah, it, it's extremely been fantastic. Good. Thank you, Jim. Those were outstanding. And every one of those fish, I could I could attest to them. Well, <laughs> thank you. All Especially so the tied down caddis. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. You oh. had 15 people stay the whole course. It's, they're still here. Yeah. So All right. I'll see you guys time. next week. Thank All you. Right. Later, everybody. Bye. Bye.